Welcome, everyone. I'm Melissa Joles, Director of Marketing for RDA. I'd like to give you a brief introduction of who we are. RDA is a group of independent PBE distributors throughout the United States. Our goal is to provide our members and their collision shop customers marketing and sales support. We're glad to have you here today. And to find out more about RDA, you can go to our website at www.rda-impact.com. Frank Turlip, founder and CEO of Auto Tech Accelerators, is your presenter for today's webinar on the six disruptions the collision industry will face in 2020 and beyond. The presentation will take approximately 55 minutes. We are recording it and we'll post it on our YouTube channel. If you have questions during the webinar, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom right of your screen. Frank will answer them at the end of the presentation. Now, I'll turn it over to Frank. Oh, thanks, Melissa. Truly appreciate it and welcome everybody. Um, I, I thought I would start out with a little, you know, probably everybody feels the way I do. Uh, for the last six weeks, most of us have been cooped up in, in, a, in our homes or apartments or condos. So if you feel this way, I, I know exactly how you feel. So I'm going to go move on and I'm going to talk about the six major disruptions the collision industry will face in 2020 and beyond. I'm not gonna go through the details of the list here, um, but these are the six that I'm going to talk about. I'm gonna start with COVID-19, then I'm gonna end with new repair requirements, which is also, in my opinion, going to disrupt the collision repair industry. So some key takeaways that you're gonna get, you're going to, I'm gonna discuss how the, the virus will change our industry. I'm gonna talk about how the digitalization of the automobile will challenge everything we know about our industry. I'm gonna talk about why all businesses must become digital and implement technology to compete and win. I'm gonna talk about digital inter intermediaries and how and why they're going to get between the shop and the consumer. We'll talk about M&A and consolidation. And then I'm gonna talk about, again, new repair requirements uh, related to uh, calibrations and test trucks. I'm not going to spend much time on my background. I've had the pleasure of being in this industry for 40 plus years. Um, I started uh, in the mid 80s. I built my first software platform after raising $100,000 from an angel investor um, in the mid 80s. I continued to build software in the 90s. Uh, today, um, I'm a published author of a book, which you'll see in a minute, and recently started my fourth startup um, that is called Test Drive Copilot, which is a new mobile app and software platform that we believe will change the way test drives are performed, managed, and documented forever. And since we've been cooped up for six weeks, my team's also working on a new platform for vehicle calibrations. So. Again, I believe Melissa is going to share this with you later, but there's several way, ways to reach me on my email. You can look me up on LinkedIn, look me up on Facebook. You can visit our websites at testdrivecopilot.com. You can visit our autodisruption.com website as well. And my book, Auto Industry Disruption, which I wrote in 2019, little did I know when I wrote the book, that we were going to be disrupted by a, by a virus. Um, but what's interesting, if you do get the book, the virus is going to accelerate, in my opinion, everything I wrote about in the book. And if you do buy the paperback, I donate $5 back for every paperback purchase to the Collision Industry Foundation. So with that said, let's talk about disruption and start out with the definition of disruption. Formal definition is a disruption is a disturbance that interrupts an event, an activity, or a process. I think we could all agree that COVID-19 is a disruption. Now, when it comes to business, disruption also occurs when new products, services, create a new market, and in the process, we can transform or destroy existing product categories, markets, or industries. Um, an example of a business disruption would be what Netflix did to Blockbuster. That's just an example, okay? Let's move on 
to COVID-19 and the collision repair industry. Now, if you haven't figured it out already, I'm a fast talker. So I'm sorry, it's just, you know, born and raised in Chicago, I had to talk fast. So the good news is this will be recorded. So let's talk about what COVID has done to our industry and other industries as well. Well, we all know about the stay-at-home orders and we're all going crazy because of it. Uh, depends on where you're at, uh, but mileage and accidents and claims have been down by as much as 80%. Now, I've also talked to shops that are up because they're in areas with hail and tornadoes. So again, it's going to vary dramatically depending on where it's at, where you're at. Um, in the United States, 20 million plus filed for unemployment in April. Unbelievable number. And Uber and Lyft and some uh, Airbnb also today just announced some major layoffs as well. New car sales are down dramatically. The OEM plants are closed. Hope to reopen this month in May. Uh, they're delaying new models. The Ford EMAC is delayed. The Hummer is delayed. I could go through the list. Rental car companies are in huge trouble. Hertz is trying to fight off bankruptcy. Avis just lost tens of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, everybody in our industry is affected negatively. My company's affected negatively, negatively. But, you know, because of this, there's new sanitary and cleaning process everywhere we go. Now we all have to wear masks when we leave the house. Um, insurers and uh, independent appraisers are not sending people out in the, in the marketplace. And for all of us, almost every business except those selling food online, uh, PPE equipment, sanitary equipment, and, and some others, like I heard today, Papa John's Pizza is up 20%. Most businesses have a cash flow and expense challenge right now. So what happens next? Well, for my opinion, um, while we are going to see an increase in miles driven, I don't think it's ever going to get back to where it's been for a very, very long time. It's my opinion that many businesses are figuring out, you know what? My people couldn't work at home. So let's let them work at home when they want. That's going to drive down mileage. Higher unemployment is going to drive down mileage. Now, that will come back over time, but it's going to come back slower than all of us think about. Uh, younger generation prefer not to have cars anyway, right? We know new car, car sales. The new forecast is between 12 and 13 million. But what does that mean to our industry? That means the newer technology is going to be delayed coming back into the marketplace. We're going to see increased m and consolidation all over the world including our industry. I believe that the new sanitary and cleaning processes will become standard in the collision industry and everywhere else. I also believe pickup and delivery services for the automotive industry is gonna become standard. And whether we like it or not, and I know our industry does not like technology, get ready for a rapid acceleration of technology implementation into our industry. Remote estimating is going to be a given. Whether you like it or not, it's going to take, that's going to be the main way people write estimates in the near future. Artificial intelligence is going to be big. Online scheduling, anything that can be a touchless claim, all of that technology that, that was being tested is going to be accelerated into our industry. So what do you do? What's, what's a collision shop or a business to do within our industry regard to COVID? Well, number one, you really need to review and act on your internal processes and procedures, right? Make sure you've got them dialed in. Number two, you're probably gonna need to implement new operating procedures related to sanitation, cleansing, and so on. Obviously, you need to make sure your cash flow is good. So you need to look at cash acceleration strategies, look at your accounts receivable, look at your outstanding, your outstanding AR, et cetera. If you didn't like marketing before, you better figure out and increase all of your marketing, your retention services. We talked about the sanitation processes. Um, if you haven't been paperless before, you need to think about going paperless and implementing a touch less check-in process, online scheduling, customer self-check-in and technologies, digital repair and supplement technologies need to be implemented, self-checkout and online payment 
options, electronic documentation, the importance of a CRM, a customer communication platform, is much more important than it has been in the past. So you can stay in, in constant contact with your customers. And of course, you need to over communicate to your employees to make sure that they understand where the company is going and what they can expect going forward. So that's the first disruption. Now let's talk about what else it's driving the additional disruptions in the collision industry. And there, there's a few things driving it. Number one, every government in the world is trying to solve this problem. On average, almost 1.3 million people are killed every year due to the traffic deaths. Nine out of 10 are caused by human error. So the government, this, this is a big deal for the governments, right? You look at the United States. Now, this is from last, this is from last year. I just recently read yesterday or the day before, I think traffic deaths were down, but to about 36,000 people for 2019. Um, so, but there's there's an organization all over the United States in every city has vision zero, zero deaths, zero accidents zero emissions. And a lot of the OEMs have that same vision. So, so that's driving the disruption. And whether we like it or not, software is a key component of everything we touch, everything that the automobiles are being put together with, software is eating the world. So those are some of the main drivers of the disruptions. Now let's talk about the digitalization of the automobile. Did you know that the first connected car came to us in 1925? Pretty cool looking connected car, isn't it? The big old radio antenna at the top. A little different than today. Now, let's, so that's the beginning. Now, in the 1980s and the 1990s, Carnegie Mellon was trying to, to again to work on these self-driving cars. You can look at the van on the left. I can just imagine the mini computers or the mini mainframes that sat in the back of that Chevy van. And who knows what other computers were in that 1995 self-driving car. By the way, that vehicle, that, that van made a self-driving trip from San Diego to the East Coast to almost 2,800 miles. Now, in, in the early 2000s, DARPA, which is Department of Defense, had a challenge, it was a $1 million challenge, and they were gonna pay anybody a million dollars who could create a self-driving car that would, would be self-driven in the desert. Well, these are the two winners between 2005 and 2007. So the, those, those, the 80s here, and, and the early 2000s, these were the beginning of what we're seeing today. So let's look at what we're looking at today in terms of digitalization. First and foremost, in 2022, which is two years away, 97% of all vehicles will include automatic emergency braking or a, a piece of ADAS. That means almost all vehicles in 2022, manufacturing 2022, will include some type of ADAS. That's gonna change the way the industry operates. Then you start to look at the implementation of internet, internet of things devices. All of those sensors on the vehicles that we repair are internet of things devices, cameras, sensors, et cetera. It, it's, gonna, it's got the typical hockey stick growth that you're gonna see in devices. Now, where on this car could you have a dent or an accident that would not affect a sensor or an electronic component. And this is what we're going to do. De we're dealing with in some cases today in the newer cars, and it's only going to continue in new model years. And we talk about software. You look at the bottom, you look at this. This is the software, the millions lines of codes. On the bottom, the bottom two is an F-22 Raptor and a space shuttle. On the top is a modern high-end car. 
So actually, we're building cars that are more complicated than rocket scientists sending the space shuttle to the moon. And this is only going to continue. So what does that mean to the design of the vehicle? Well, what you see here is th this is the internal electronic components of a vehicle. On the left is what the old fashioned vehicles uh, spine, used electronic spine used to look like, okay? Today they've moved to the middle where you've got an electronic secure gateway, which we'll talk about a little later, where they're, they're securing all of the other ECUs. But coming soon to the right is vehicles are gonna be driven by a server. Think of it like a server in your office or think of it like a server in the cloud. A server is going to be the main component of the electronics of the vehicle going forward. Another big deal are mobile apps. The consumers love their mobile apps. And so all of the OEMs and other companies are putting and integrating the mobile apps into the car. Some of you, I'm sure, have these already. So big deal, and it's only going to continue to increase. And, and we're talking about ADAS, we talk about um, AEB. Today, there are 18 different safety systems on the road. We're going to revisit this later, but 18 different safety systems on the road today. When you look at that, I want you to think about our industry. There's no way a single independent will be able to properly identify, diagnose, and repair all of these systems. There's no way a consolidator is going to be able to do it in all their locations. So what you're gonna see, this is gonna drive specialization. You're gonna see the consolidators, the major network players, they're gonna designate locations to fix specific makes and models. You're gonna see collision repairs move from a generalist to maybe being a domestic, an Asian, or a German. There's just no way going forward, in my opinion, that an independent who thinks he can fix all cars can properly fix them today. Next on the horizon, a big deal, slowed down though by somewhat of the COVID, is electrification. This is the great image of the Rivian electric truck. Um, electrification is going to be huge. Again, COVID slowing this down a little bit, but let me tell you, there's going to be tons of new electric models going forward which means how you repair them, how they're diagnosed, how they're calibrated, et cetera, is all gonna change compared to what we're doing today. And it's also going to change the way we repair them and how we make vehicles. For example, an EV has 100 times fewer moving parts than an internal combustion engine. So what does that mean? Well, number one, think about the factories. If you're not making internal combustion engines, you're probably not making a transmission. You're probably not making a drivetrain. So it changes the entire model of the automotive industry. And by the way, if you're a dealership, you're gonna to have to have two types of technicians, one for internal combustions, and you're gonna to have to have one for EVs. So major disruption in the business. Over the air updates, another disruption. So, with this, there's great things about this, right? You can you can fix a recalls, you can update the car with newer stuff, et cetera, et cetera. But where are the over-the-air updates going to come from? Are they going to come from the manufacturer or are they going to come from the dealer? If they're coming from the manufacturer, it, it starts to disintermediate the dealer from having that face-to-face -face of an ongoing con con connectivity with, with the consumer. So again, disruption in the dealer market. And again, you're gonna see a ton more driver sensing technologies. Remember I talked about 90% of accidents are caused by human error. So how do we do that? We put more sensors in to monitor the people who are driving the cars. Here's an example of, of an iris scan technology to see if your eyes are awake or to see if you're falling asleep at the wheel. Here's a patent from Rivian, which is going to be able to monitor everybody in the cabin, 
to make sure they're okay, they're healthy, they're fit, blah, blah, blah. So again, you're going to start to see a lot more sensors inside of the car in addition to ones being put outside of the car to measure what's going on outside. So what do all these sensors and software, what does it mean? Well, that means there's a ton of data being generated by these connected cars, a ton. So give me an example of what a ton means. If you look on the right, these are typical things we do with data. Video streaming, music streaming, web browsing, turn-by-turn -turn navigation, et cetera, right? That's what we typically do on your left. That's the typical data generated by a connected car every single hour. So there's tons of data now. Is it organized today in the way it should be? Absolutely not. But what is it leading to? Well, what it's leading to is all of the manufacturers, all of them are building operating systems so they can handle the data. You can see Volkswagen, General Motors, FCA, Toyota, Nissan, Ford, all manufacturers are building operating systems so they can manage the data and then monetize the data. Really, really important. Now, again, think about this. Think of an operating system in a car like Microsoft. So instead of having a Microsoft operating system, an Apple operating system, and a Linux operating system, which are the three main ones we have in the world today for computers, or think of an Android operating system or an iOS operating system for phones, smartphones today, you're gonna to have 18 different operating systems. So again, another reason why it's gonna be very difficult for an independent business, repair business, auto, collision, truck, glass, to repair all these vehicles. Now, these operating systems are gonna drive telematics. And telematics are gonna have their tentacles everywhere. You start at the top, you got geofencing, you got road assistance, you got et cetera, et cetera, for productivity. You go to the left, you've got expandability, which means open APIs, integration to these platforms, an online marketplace, mobile apps, et cetera. You move down where it says compliance, right? You got emissions, you got inspections. You move down a little further more where it says fleet optimization, remote diagnostics, predictive maintenance, um, engine faults, right, root optimization. And then you move up to the blue where it says safety, you got everything related to safety. So again, telematics is going to affect every aspect of how that vehicle operates, how people repair it, how people communicate with it. Very, very, very important. Now, where there's software, where there's sensors, there is what's called hacking. So I want to talk a little bit about auto cyber security. Now, I don't have enough time here to show you this, but there's, there's a great, if you go to YouTube, there's a great video, type in 2015 Jeep hack on YouTube, and you got to watch the video. It shows how two guys hack a Chrysler Jeep, which, by the way, caused a major challenge for Chrysler back then. They had to do a major recall, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so we talk about auto cybersecurity. So in a typical new car today, if you look on the left, these are all the potential ways for someone to hack a vehicle, many different ways. And on the right, again, you look at all the different modules that could also be hacked on a vehicle. So I want you to think about this. And I was talking to Melissa about this the other day. Let's say I'm a hacker from the wonderful country of North Korea, and I figure out how to penetrate, I'm going to use Chry uh, Chrysler's entire vehicle electronic system. This is, well, I'm not talking about one vehicle. If they could do that, what if they pressed a single button and all Chrysler's with that newer platform were shut off in the middle of the road? That would cause major problems. So what you're seeing is, is Chrysler was the first to do it because they were the first to get hacked. You're seeing, you're seeing vehicles put in secure gateways. Secure gateways protects all of those 
important safety security features and it prevents people from getting in through the most, the easiest way is to the ODB port. So again, you're gonna see more and more of this, which is gonna drive, uh, it's gonna make it more difficult for aftermarket tools to get access quickly. Um, so big deal. So I'm not wanna just talk about what's going on. I wanna give you some ideas of what you need to do. So going forward with related to the new vehicle, Number one, focus on quality and safe repairs. You can't go wrong. Number two, you must, 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 must use repair procedures in every vehicle. Not an option. The change, the vehicle changes. You can't fix today's cars or diagnose today's cars with old history, by the way, or old knowledge. It just doesn't work. You need, as a business, you need to decide on what future investments you're gonna make, depending on what vehicles you're gonna repair. And if you're afraid of vehicle electronics, my comment would be get out of the business because it's only going to get more complicated and more electronic. Specialize. Specialize in a particular set of vehicles and get really, really good at those vehicles. Obviously, invest in the right tools and equipment. By doing that, you're going to have to implement the repair process and you need to educate the, your customers and your employees. So, okay, that's what to do regarding the digitalization of the vehicle. The digitalization of the business. For many of you who know me, I've been talking about this stuff for 30 years, right? I remember the first time I walked into a shop in the 80s going, hey, you need to write a computerized estimate. And I remember them looking at me like, are you from Mars? Well, the choices are gone. They're, I don't know how people today survive without automating their business. And you have to remember why I say this. You, a, a auto repair, auto collision, whatever business it is, you're not being compared to other businesses anymore. You're being compared to Google. You're being compared to Amazon. You're being compared to everything. Now, I want you to think about that. So we've now spent six weeks in our homes or our condos or, or our apartments. And what have we done? Where do we order our stuff from? Online. So guess what? It ain't going to change. So if you, as a collision repair or a business, are lacking in that area, you got some catching up to do. Because you are going to be compared. And if I'm a consumer, and I can go find somebody electronically, communicate electronically, schedule electronically, get updates electronically, do remote estimating electronically. I'm going there. I don't want to go to their shop. How do I know? Anyway. So again, you're not being compared to other shops. You're being compared to companies like Google and Amazon. So what do you got to do? Well, I'm not going to go through this list, but you better have a damn good website. You better start thinking about video. You better th start thinking about mobile apps. If you haven't figured out the thing about online reviews, you're in deep trouble. Um, today, electronic invoicing, electronic signatures, critical. Critical. People don't even want to handle cash anymore. So you want you want to hand them a printed invoice? I don't want it. Talked about remote-based estimating. I think video is going to play a major, major piece, a major place going forward. Artificial intelligence, buckle your seatbelts, boys and girls. It's going to come and it's going to come fast because of this COVID. And Again, um, you start to think about the technologies in the vehicles, okay? It won't be first notice of loss anymore. It'll be instant notice of loss, or here, as I say, instant notice of need. Remember, we're not just talking about crashes with these sensors. sensors. We're talking about preventive maintenance. We're talking about sensor failure, potential sensor failure. So again, instant, not first, but instant. So what should a shop do? Well, you, read, you need, first and foremost, you need to identify digital partners. And I will tell you, not everyone, can, not one company can do everything. So you need, you need to find them, you need to interview them, and you need to partner with the right ones. Obviously, estimating, shop management, and workflow are key. But 
website, SEO. When I, and you'll notice when I say type in voice, most of you probably have an Alexa. Or most of you talk into your phone and you say, uh, Google, help me, you know, what's the nearest restaurant near me? So SEO, not about typing, but also voice is going to be important. Reviews, appointments, you can read this. These are the technologies that are going to be anti into the game. This is what the consumer expects. This is what the consumer has been doing for the last six weeks. I know I have. All right, a next disruption. And this has been going on in the collision industry for a while. I call them digital intermediaries. And what this means is this is a company or an organization, a website, a mobile app, whatever you want to call it, that sits between the customer and the business. And by the way, if you don't know it, this is big business. Here are some examples of intermediaries, apps, websites, whatever you want to call them, that have been funded by venture capitalists to become an intermediary in the business. 181 companies are in this space. So this is not this is not going away. Now, for all of us in the collision industry, we already know the big three intermediaries between us, between the customer and the shop. Obviously, number one, we've got the insurance marketplace. They sit right smack dab, the part of that triangle on the front, on the top right. You've got software companies like CCC1 that are now sitting between the consumer that are going on to the websites and apps between the consumer and yourself. And then last but newest are the OEMs with their repair networks. The OEMs, they wanna retain their branding. They wanna retain those customers. There's a lot of revenue that's at risk for them in parts and other things and reputation. So they're, uh, they're uh, placing themselves again between the customer and the repair facilities. So those are examples of intermediaries. So what do you do? Well, interview them all and find the ones that fit your business model and your strategy. And by the way, you're probably going to have multiple intermediaries. I'm sure many of you who are on the call are on DRP programs and on OEM certification programs and are using a CCC1. So you're already doing it, okay? But again, everybody has the cost. You should negotiate the fees. And most importantly, most importantly, what have they done for you with regard to them getting you the repairs they've said or giving you the information they said or, or whatever the case may be? You need to measure their performance each and every quarter. Next, talk about M&A and consolidation, okay? So I'm gonna start out with the largest Collision Repair Consolidator in, in North America, Caliber. And this, this is a comment directly from the CEO that there will be more consolidation. Now, there won't be right now because all acquisitions and capital spending for most of these consolidators are, are on hold. But trust me, when, this, when we get past this, in my opinion, it's going to increase dramatically. And why do I say that? Well, here's another. They, an executive from one of the big three. They, before COVID, they had between 100 and 150 acquisitions in the pipeline for 2020. Have, after speaking with this individual in the middle of COVID a couple of weeks ago, he believes that number is going to double. Vince Rome is a good friend of mine. He states by 2021, he believes 44% could be dominated by the big three. Uh, by the big three, 20, you can read the numbers. Um, and and car stars, this is the car star stated goal is to have 1,100 locations and 2 billion sales by next year. And we all just heard the news, or if you didn't, the news just came out that uh, German brands just bought Fix USA and Auto, uh, Auto Center Auto Body. So again, it's going to continue. And here's an example. Here's some statistics, high level statistics between 2016 and 2019. The big three, 
the networks, and on the right, what I'll call your regional MSLs. They're all growing. And that's in three years. Well, that's those are your numbers. So why is this? Why? Well, many, many years ago, I did a presentation when I was at Mitchell and we talked about the service pyramid. And, and the service industry pyramid used to look like this. Or they all typically start out like this. You get the biggest and the best at the top, and they're typically the top 1%. And as you move down, the numbers increase. And on the bottom, you typically have the largest number of, of businesses within that pyramid. But here's what happens to a service industry. It, someone grabs it in the middle and squeezes it. And what happens there is those middle of the road businesses get squeezed. They're going to make a decision. Do I get acquired or do I stay and move down? And what happens is you get, a, or you get an industry that kind of looks like this. Happens in most every service industry. Uh, and we're, our industry is no, no different. So, and by the way, M&A consolidation is a business thing. It's not just an industry thing. Big companies will continue acquiring smaller companies because affordable capital creates economies of scale and then it becomes a virtuous cycle, right? Each acquisition builds economies of scale, which equates to a competitive advantage. And, and so, so by doing that, if they do it right, by the way, it increases the value in, of the business in excess of what they paid for it. And this is simply called accretive acquisitions or multiple arbitrage in the financial world. And, and whether we like it or not, the financial markets like to reward bigger and more profitable businesses, which provides liquidity to these larger businesses in forms of debt, which allows them to get more money and to make more acquisitions. Welcome to the game of M&A. So what do you do? If you're not in a big organization, what do you do? Well, I've been saying this first one forever. In today's world, it's very difficult to be on an island by yourself. You need to become part of something bigger. I'm not saying you need to be, become uh, a consolidator. I'm not saying you need to become a franchise. You need to figure out what you want to be when you grow up, okay? But I don't believe you can operate on an island. Second of all, focus on your local community. Become, become an important part of your local community, which they can't live without you. Talked about it earlier, specialize. You need to specialize in a specific area of the business. And you know what? You got to stay ahead of the technological tsunami. You have to stay ahead. If you fall behind, you're going to get killed. You need to be aggressive. And the last one, you know, people, it's a little controversial. In my opinion, you're either growing or you're dying in any business, right? So if you're not going to grow, if you just want to hang around, this might not be the best time to sell because of the COVID. But I'm telling you, you know, as, as if your company does not progress, it regresses. And that means your valuation goes down. So it's something to consider. The last thing I want to talk about are new repair requirements, okay? And there's really two that I want to talk about. I want to talk about calibrations, and I want to talk about test drive, okay? But why am I going to talk about this? Well, first and foremost, it's my belief that everything a repairer does, they need to document a vehicle repair like they're going to court the next day. And that's why I believe the bulletproof file is absolutely critical. And what is a bulletproof file? Anything and everything you do to that vehicle, from estimate, from notes, from images, from videos, from calibration, from test drives, everything needs to be documented and put in that file, period. Again, think about Every car you repair, you could go to court tomorrow. Now, why are the repair requirements changing? Well, you've seen this slide earlier. ADAS changes everything. ADAS changes everything. And you've also seen this slide earlier. 18 different safety systems. Think about this. 
All 18 of those operate completely differently. All of their systems have different names. They all trigger at different speeds, at different transactions, different actions by, by the driver. Each of these are completely separate and unique. And so what that means is, after you repair a vehicle, they're all gonna to have to be calibrated and they all get calibrated differently. Now we talk about calibrations. It's my belief 90% of the shops don't have the room to put in calibration equipment. And, and, and again, I won't go through the, the, the detail requirements, but you look around the, the industry, 90% of the shops don't have extra space. And by the way, if you think about the extra space, are you gonna make more money calibrating vehicles via OEM processes, which by the way, you won't, because I know what it takes, or do you continue to pump out three or four cars a day from that bay? It's a big decision to make. Second of all, 85% of the shops don't have the people. They can't even hire good body technicians. How are they gonna hire good calibration technicians? It's a big challenge, it's a big challenge. And most recently, as of yesterday, because I was on the committee, spent many, many months on this, PICA is going to be releasing new calibration standards. And this is going to be applied through collision and glass. And the standard process is going to be simple. And this is for glass, pre-repair roll test. And then the rest are going to be for collision and glass. Pre-scan, repair, post-scan, calibration, roll test. That's the standard that SICA is, is documented based on industry uh, feedback from companies like myself. So let's talk about calibrations. According to CCC's numbers, less than 5% of the vehicles that need to get calibrated are getting calibrated. So what does that mean? Are they, are they repaired correctly? I don't know. I don't know. Today, mostly dealerships are doing it. And by the way, they don't know how to do most, most dealerships don't do them right, or they don't document it correctly. You got mobile technicians doing calibrations in, in areas that don't have enough light, which is a nightmare in itself. You've got some repair facilities uh, doing it in-house. You've got some that have built a, a, a building or separated bays, and they put a calibration facility in there. And last but not least, you've got a very few very few organizations today that are specifically 100% designated for calibration centers. It's my belief that the, the last two, the last two are gonna grow dramatically in the next three to five years. So that's calibrations. Now let's talk about test drives, okay? So if you haven't, if you haven't looked at Body Shop Business Online, Jason Stahl just did a really cool little video on the importance of test drives and, and, and how it relates to a shop's reputation. I can also tell you in conversations with a large organization in the business, before they started doing proper test drives, or after they started, excuse me, after they started doing proper test drives, their, their CSI percentage went up 4% because they were validating the vehicle was repaired properly, which brings me to the question. Is a vehicle repaired properly if all systems are not tested and validated via a test drive after a repair is complete? Is a vehicle properly repaired if you haven't taken the car out and validated all the systems that are on the car work as they're supposed to? In my subjective opinion, it is not but I'll leave that decision to you and your business. And what do I mean by test drive requirements? Well, here's three middle of the road vehicles, a Mazda, a Ford, and a Subaru. A Mazda 8S system, when, when equipped, has 11 systems that need to be validated. Ford 360 has 11, Subaru has seven. These are all the systems that need to be checked, at what speeds they need to be checked, and what to look for in those systems. So what I'm gonna show you now is the best way anywhere in the world to manage document and get reimbursed 
for test drives. We're going to talk about test drive copilot. Here's a quick video on how we address test drives. So the information comes over from CCC. You select the vehicle that you repair that you want to perform a test drive on. You can also search for your repair orders. You don't want to drive, you select no drive. You pick the RO you want to test drive. The RO exists because I integrate with CCC. So all you need to do is who's going to do the test drive? The mileage on the vehicle. And what type of test drive is it? And then you want to also validate the insurance company is correct because it came over from CCC. And then you hit recommendations. And now what we present to the person is the requirements and recommendations by the OEM of what needs to be done on the test drive. And then we record everything. Time, miles, speed, everything. And, and the user can also actually, when they're stopped and they want to review the test drive requirements, checklist, or recommendations, they have the ability to press that little red item icon at the top, and they can review their recommendations when they're stopped. So again, we're not only recording the audio, the video, we're also recording the audio of the driver as well. But stop, you're done. So what happens after we press stop? Well, we do two things. Number one, we automatically send an email with a report to the shop. And we send an automatic email with a billing statement to the shop as well. Here's an example of the report. It tracks year, make, model, road test type, technicians, time, speed, miles. We just finished the weather connection, so we'll know what the weather is. A link, the video link is to the video. The speed graph on the bottom of the left tells you how fast the vehicle got at what period of the test drive. In the middle at the top, you notice a, you'll notice a map. We track exactly where that vehicle went, how many left turns, how many right turns, et cetera, et cetera. And then we produce uh, the recommendations that the checklist that should have been done during the test drive. So think about a test drive today. Number one, there's no way to document it. Number two, this is one of the few times the shop loses custody of the vehicle. So did Frankie take the car to the liquor store? Did he drive it through McDonald's? Blah, blah, blah. Gives you an opportunity to document the entire process. Also gives you, we provide you with a billing statement so you can produce this to be reimbursed with the repair. And again, we have all of the test drive recommendations for all the major systems we had talked about earlier to help your business properly perform, manage, and document test drives. So again, why? Documentation, 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 test drive requirements and checklists by making test drive. It also gives you the ability to manage your cost and the quality control of your test drives. If you want to find out more, just go visit www.testdrivecopilot.com. Everything's on the website. And last but not least, if you want a copy of my book, you can go to auto-disruption.com or you can go to www.amazon.com. And Melissa, I am now ready for any and all questions. Okay. Okay. The first question, um, it goes back to the code slide. 
for your lines of the code slide, is it possible that vehicles have more lines of code because it's, it is an inefficient code? If a top-notch developer can work for Google, Facebook, or Ford, or GM, uh, does more lines of code mean more techn technologically advanced, or maybe there's room for improvement? Well, <laughs> the answer is on that one, it could go either way. Um, mm -hmm. More lines of code doesn't necessarily mean it's good code, but mm -hmm. typically a developer, particularly companies like Google, and by the way, Google owns Waymo, which is which is a autonomous vehicle company. So when you look at them developing, they're going to try to develop the most efficient software they can. Um, so the answer is it depends. It depends on who the developer is. It depends on who's managing it. But I will tell you, most of the, the OEM manufacturers today, um, they're outsourcing that development to other people. And most development houses try to try to be as efficient as possible when it comes to code. So I don't know if that's a good answer, but that's what I know. I will follow up uh, with everybody on the call uh, with Frank's contact information. So if you do want to follow up with him directly, you can do that. If anybody on the call wants more information about RDA, our members, or any of our programs, you can go visit our website at www.rda-impact.com. Um, and I don't see questions here, Frank, so um, we're going to conclude the webinar. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate everybody's time, and uh, we'll be in touch with future training opportunities. Thanks, Thank everybody. You. Be safe. Be safe and healthy.